Assalamu alaikum everyone. I am Sultan Mahmoud, campus research co-ambassador, um, BRBD. Uh, our, um, today's our honorable guest, Dr. Arif Jewel, Assistant Director, Agricultural Engineering, Rural Development Academy, Bogura. Uh, today's our uh, 14th research idea series. Our topic is Engineering and, Te uh, engineering and Technology 1. Uh, the seminar will be held on effect on seepage on sediment dynamics and rheology of cohesive, uh, cohesionless soil. I am requesting our honorable guest, Dr. Arif Jewel, to start his lecture. Sir, please start your lecture. OK. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sultan Mahmoud, for your kind introduction. So hello, everyone. I would like to uh, introduce myself a little before starting the presentation. So my name is Arif Hussain Jewel. Uh, I'm working as a student director at Rural Development Academy, Bogra. And uh, I'm, in, I'm basically an agricultural engineer. I did my uh, bachelor from Agricultural University in Agricultural Engineering. Then I did my master's and PhD from Kyoto University uh, under Honorable Scholarship. And I uh, joined Rural Development Academy in Pokhara in 2013. Then I worked here for three years. Then I went to Japan for pursuing master's and PhD uh, from 2016 to 2021. So I, I just finished my PhD in the last September. And after finishing my PhD, I came back to Bangladesh. So it's a great opportunity for me to uh, present my uh, research topics uh, with B research or BD. So it's a great and good initiative. So I'd like to uh, thank Beer BD for inviting me and make an opportunity to present my research topics uh, with all of you. And from now, I'm going to start my presentation. So before starting my presentation, just I would like to say that this is what I'm going to present. It is from part of my PhD research. So I have set a title of my today's talk. So it's effect of CPAs on sediment dynamics and rheology of cohesionless soil. So in this topic, actually, I would like to talk about erosion and uh, like from the viewpoint of hydraulics and uh, from the viewpoint of soil mechanics, I would like to talk about uh, sediment dynamics and uh, the rheology of the soil. And Today's, uh, today's topics, what I'll cover is background of my research, then I'll talk about effect of CPS flow on incipient motion of sand particles, then I'll talk about rheological modeling of sand at its surface during low confining stress. And finally, I would like to talk about uh, conclusion and future work. So in background and objectives, uh, I would like to show you some pictures of damage. So when we see this kind of picture, like a erosion, landslide, dam failure. So uh, like what comes to our mind? So it's a kind of great uh, disaster and hazard and it loses lives, then is a property and it surely have adverse impact on economy. And what are the causes of such kind of failures? So, like, if we consider the dam failure, so the main causes of the dam failure is seepage piping. These are the one, these are the main uh, uh, causes, and it has other causes also, like overtopping, heavy rainfall, and unprotected slope. And it, obviously, if we use low graded material, so like if you uh, see the left figure, like river erosion picture. So uh, here you, you can see it's a kind of, uh, in, in the field of hydraulics or river engineering, we deal about like how erosion happens uh, in the river bed or the embankment of river. And if we consider this middle figure here, landslide. So when a landslide happens, so this, this is kind of a mud flow or big mass flow in the, from a hilly area or a slopey area. So these topics are generally covered from the viewpoint of hydraulics and soil mechanics. 
And if you see the <coughs> cornermost, right cornermost figure here, I have shown a uh, Arden Dam, and here there is the reservoir upstream of the dam, and there is obviously uh, something in the downstream of the dam. So what you see that <coughs> one of the important causes of dam failures uh, in uh, in the world, around 40% of the dam uh, is failed due to the piping erosion. So what is piping? Like it's a kind of internal form of erosion where the particles, soil particles are drained or washed away and it makes a pipe from where seepage happens and gradually it creates a, a big, uh, the bigger diameter hole and which eventually makes a collapse of the dam. So. Uh, this actually, uh, this kind of piping or the internal erosion is uh, lying between boundary between soil mechanics and hydraulics. So that's why uh, actually this topics is not, um, how to say, uh, there are many resource, uh, there are many resources which have been done uh, individually from the viewpoint of soil mechanics and from the viewpoint of hydraulics, but by correlating how to correlate and how to make a model by combining these two types of things has not uh, there are a few researchers in this field so i have chosen some kind of topics to for my research and uh, i'd like to broaden my uh, objective here like if we uh, consider this kind of phenomena here what we see there are bigger diameter particles these are the soil particles and there are smaller diameter uh, particles so uh, particles it's kind of a combination of many different kinds of diameter particles. So here, dotted arrow shows the detachment of a single soil particle and solid arrow uh, mentions the motion of soil mass. So what uh, what we call soil mass, so when we, call, when, when we find a mass or aggregate of soil particle, then it is a soil mass, but individual means single particle or two or more particles our detachment is called kind of single particle movement. So separation of single or small number of particles are, and this is kind of pickup rate or erosion rate, which is really in the field of hydraulics. But aggregate of soil particles, which is kind of a mass of particle, which is when a failure happens due to a piping or internal erosion, then it is fluidly deformed and it is kind of continuous motion. So what uh, we cannot deal in the field of hydraulics because in con continuum motion, we have to define a shear rate, which is possible in the field of uh, soil mechanics. But when you deal about hydraulics or river engineering, we don't think about this continuum motion and shear rate. So we need a bridging for both types of discipline if we want to make a system uh, which can accurately handle soil erosion problem or the erosion problem in the field, then we have to combine this type of topic. So uh, the objective of my research topic is uh, I would like to see the CPS effect on soil erosion and from the viewpoint of hydraulics and uh, uh, make a rheological modeling from the viewpoint of soil mechanics. And from now, I'd like to talk about the effect of injection on incipient motion of sand particles. So what is the motivation and what's the challenges between this, uh, for this type of topics? Actually, uh, I've said here injection. So injection is a kind of uh, CPS, uh, like there are two kinds of CPS flow, like parallel CPS flow and normal CPS flow. If you see here, parallel CPS flow is, CPS flow is happens under, uh, under the surface or in, in the groundwater. Uh, so uh, when, if we consider a stream where uh, the, if the CPS flow is parallel to the stream flow, then it is called parallel CPS flow. And if the CPS flow is normal to the uh, stream flow, then it is called normal CPS flow. But depending on the direction of the normal CPS flow, we can divide it into injection and suction. Injection is also called upward CPS flow and suction is called downward CPS flow. So it depends on the groundwater level. So a groundwater level with respect to the stream uh, or the channel water level. So if there is a uh, difference between the groundwater level and stream water level, so suppose if the elevation head of the stream water is higher than the groundwater level or the phreatic line, then uh, water from the channel will try to seep into the groundwater. So it is called uh, injection. But when uh, the groundwater level or the phreatic surface is higher than the uh, stream flow, then 
groundwater will try to seep into the river. So this is called suction. And uh, this is actually uh, happens uh, through the permeable boundaries. Permeable boundaries is kind of uh, soil boundaries, actually, natural rivers, irrigation and drainage facilities, or earth and dam or embankment. So uh, this flow is actually very small in comparison to the free stream or the river flow or the river uh, flow velocity or the amount of water. But this kind of small uh, injection flow can cause some geodynamic hazard because it changes the near bad flow hydrodynamics like velocity distribution of the channel and bad shear stress and sediment transport phenomena. So there are a lack of reverse study and there are many opinions about the action of the seepage flow or the injection flow. And most studies are completed in the field of open channel condition. So we wanted to check in a laboratory flow, which is from the viewpoint of uh, erosion function apparatus, it is closed conduit. And this is the mechanics behind the sediment transport. So here, if we consider a particle which is in entrainment, like which is in the condition of the incipient motion, then like there are many forces acting on a particle. Like this is the channel flow, uh, which is the velocity distribution of the channel flow. And there might, this is if it is a ardent channel, if the boundary is permeable, then there should have seepage flow and and you see there are, there are buoyancy force and drag force and seepage force and particle weight force. Such many forces are uh, acting on a particle. So this is an enlarged frame of the uh, entrainment particle. So here, like all the forces, mainly uh, these are proportional to the diameter of the soil particle because the diameter uh, measures the exposed area of the particle. So uh, by using such kind of analysis or the force we, from the physical properties of the soil and the physical uh, phenomena, we can define different kinds of forces like that. And we can define a dimensionless quantities, which is called shield parameters, which is widely used in the field of uh, hydraulics or river engineering. So this is the ratio of the drag force and uh, submerged weight force. So by uh, doing some mathematical analysis we can get such kind of relationship then there's so we need a seepage force because in my condition or in my research there was surface flow and there was injection flow which is a form of seepage flow so seepage force is a uh, proportional to the hydraulic gradient so hydraulic gradient is nothing but uh, like uh, how, how to say hydraulic gradient is uh, proportional to the water had actually so CPS force is proportional to the hydraulic gradient. So uh, dimensionless critical bad shear stress during CPS flow. So if we consider this kind of CPS flow, that this, since CPS flow is happening to the upward direction of the uh, FG, which is submerged right force, so there is a minus sign of here. Then we can make a relationship like that. And here we should uh, keep in mind that bad shear stress of the critical bad shear stress is proportional to the shear velocity, which is U star. Then uh, here uh, we consider that ratio of the uh, dimensionless critical shear stress uh, before CPS flow or injection flow and after CPS flow or injection flow will be the same, uh, uh, will, uh, will be the equal because this is a, if you see here, there are two kinds of, it's the ratio of two kinds of force. It's the kind of horizontal force, FD is a kind of horizontal force like this one. And FG is a kind of normal force or particle force. This is the ratio of two forces. So it is a kind of uh, friction coefficient of the particles or a tangent of the angle of ripples. So it is a kind of material parameter for a material flow. We can consider that it should not be changed even if the flow or injection flow is going to happen. So from that, by doing some mathematical formulation, we can get a such kind of relationship. So this is a linear relationship you can see in this picture. So this is kind of boundary condition from where we can define, okay, uh, below this line, particles move. So when we reach this line or above this line, then particle will move. So this is a kind of linear decreasement. So as the hydraulic gradient is going to increase, then such kind of forces are going to decrease, like bad shear stress and critical bad shear stress. So we will confirm this kind of uh, figure or this kind of uh, phenomena in our result.
So these were the uh, materials or methods what we used. So these are the physical parameters of the material. So we also determined the, uh, how to say, hydraulic gradient. And uh, from the hydraulic gradient and CP's flow velocity, uh, we, <coughs> we determined the hydraulic conductivity. And this is the experiment actually. This is the uh, lab from where I did my experiment. So I used a laser based particle image velocimetry method, PIV, in short form it's called. So it is a kind of non intrusive uh, method because uh, most of the method to determine the velocity or making a velocity profile of the channel, uh, we have to use like a current meter or, uh, yeah, like crystal tube or current meter we can use to uh, or the propeller to measure the velocity but uh, it, these are the kind of destructive or intrusive method but this method is a non-intrusive method from where actually there is a laser which illuminates or uh, enlight and enlighten the channel flow and obviously the flow should be seeded with some particle because laser should cap capture from the particle velocity from some seeding particle we have to use here then we can get some picture and from this picture by analyzing doing some image analysis we can get the uh, velocity vector map from where we can get the velocity profile like that so in my channel so there was a water tank which which uh, generates the surface flow like that and there was a, uh, another tank from where we uh, generated the surface flow so this kind of two kind of uh, flow, flow is happening here the surface zone this is surface zone so I uh, focused the laser to capture the picture of both zones, like this is kind of upstream edge of the CPS zone, this is kind of CPS zone. So we uh, captured the picture in such a way by which we can analyze the velocity profile in both zones, like here and here. And there was a deposition box from where we, can, we collected the sediment uh, deposition to calculate the sediment transport rate at different hydraulic gradients. So by changing this water tank, uh, we can uh, change the hydraulic gradient of the soil column of here, like this is groundwater or ground soil. So we can change the hydraulic gradient by measure. So we can measure the hydraulic gradient using a piezometer. <coughs> Then what you can see that but I, I changed the hydraulic gradient for different times or many times to get the, uh, to analyze the bare shear stress, how the bare shear stress is going to change for different kind of hydraulic gradient. So this is actually uh, from PAB. We found a raw image like that. Then we processed such image by doing some um, image processing by using some image processing software and writing some code then we determine such kind of velocity profile or not velocity profile it's kind of velocity vector map from where we could determine uh, the velocity uh, in quantity form from uh, like how the velocity is going to change as uh, uh, as we move uh, away from the bed of the channel then after getting the velocity profile then we have to determine uh, some quantities like as i mentioned earlier like u star u star is a very important phenomena like u star here it's kind of shear velocity so shear velocity is very much important uh, in the field of hydraulics to determine the bad shear stress so from such kind of there are some such kind of equations for dealing the boundary uh, layer like boundary layer is the layer where the uh, like uh, if we uh, consider a air foil, then uh, the air is moving past through the air foil. So this is called, called uh, so this is like, uh, it's the kind of layer, boundary layer is a layer which uh, kind of between the solid and the fluid, there is a layer persist, a layer is persisting. So this is called the boundary layer. So by, uh, in the field of boundary layer, there are some mathematical formulation in tabula from long time ago, like logarithmic law and modified logarithmic law. So from here, we can use some method for car fitting or by using least square method, Newton Robson method, we can determine uh, use star value. So after getting the velocity profile, then we can determine uh, use star or shear velocity from such kind of equation. So if uh, we can determine use star, then we can determine best shear stress easily. 
but there is a problem like <clears throat> if i say about this modified logarithmic law then <clears throat> we have to follow some assumptions like modified logarithmic law is based on a layer which is <clears throat> where there will be smooth bed but if you see the previous picture here in experimental apparatus this is sand zone <clears throat> so this is not smooth actually it is very difficult to uh, from the viewpoint of physics or mechanics which is the smooth surface so there are some it should some parametric study but i'm not going to uh, talk detail in detail about such thing but in from the viewpoint of physical phenomena we can say this is smooth because this is rough because this is sand and but this is a, a glass glass uh, bed or glass sided channel acrylic water channel so this is we can from the viewpoint of physical uh, appearance we can say okay this is smooth but this is not smooth but how could we use this kind of modified logarithmic law because it is not smooth we have to get a condition from where uh, we can define it as a smooth surface so we can use modified logarithmic law but there are some other assumptions like that if we can design or define laminar sublinear thickness like delta and the grain shear Reynolds number from where we can uh, determine a flow like a channel flow is uh, hydraulically smooth rough or in between like transition zone like in between smooth and rough and we determine from our uh, flow we determine such kind of parameter then we found that our uh, delta and this uh, grain shear Reynolds number is equal to such value so it is uh, between transition in, in this range, like transition range. So, but which is very close to the smooth range value. So we can say that it is not smooth, but it is very close to the smooth range. So, and <clears throat> from the literature, we found that injection, like injection surface flow uh, increases the sublayer thickness. So if it increases sublayer thickness, it means it makes the flow uh, hydraulically smooth. So this is our strength from that point we uh, concluded that, okay, we can use in this function modified logarithmic law to determine the bad shear stress from the shear velocity in the CPS zone, although the CPS zone is not hydraulically smooth. <clears throat> and this is the car fitting results, like these are the measurements of the flow velocity uh, from the bed to the, uh, if we go away from the bed, and these lines, dotted line or the solid lines, represents the uh, logarithmic law, like uh, modified logarithmic law and normal logarithmic law. So I wanted to show here, since I did experiment for different hydraulic gradients, so I wanted to show here uh, the value of the car fitting for different hydraulic gradient. And you can see here, uh, most of the cases, the measurements and the uh, prediction or the calculated line matched well with the measurement. So it means the equation fulfills the uh, assumption. Then after determining the shear velocity, then next challenge is how to determine the critical shear velocity or the shear velocity at incipient motion. Like what is incipient motion? Like it's, it's very interesting to define here the incipient motion. So incipient motion is a kind of condition from where we can say, okay, the uh, particle of a sand particle or a gravel is just to move. It's very difficult to determine uh, bare in bare eye because uh, it's relative. From someone, they will say, okay, uh, this is the velocity or threshold velocity from where the particle is going to move. But if we ask another person, uh, he will say, no, this is the velocity. So if we see from the viewpoint of uh, uh, in, in kind of like, if we want to consider from the first movement, then uh, we cannot determine accurately and we cannot avoid uh, the scattering of our data of incipient motion. So there is another good practice or um, how to say, uh, rule by uh, where we can determine critical shear velocity. So if we can get different kinds of shear velocity or the critical shear velocity, then we should plot this kind of velocity against the sediment transport rate. So since the uh, incipient motion or threshold condition says that at that time the sediment transport rate is equal to zero because the sediment is just just to move or in a condition where uh, it's going to uh, uh, the movement is going to happen. So sediment transport rate is equal to zero. So how to get it? 
So if we extrapolate the line where y or sediment transfer rate equal to zero, then we can get a point which is in between such velocity. Then we can define, okay, this is a uh, acceptable range from where a value or range from where we can define critical shear velocity. Then after getting the critical shear velocity, so I, uh, so this is the measurement method of the critical shear velocity. From here, I would like to define for my case, for different case, uh, different uh, hydraulic gradient, I uh, plotted the shear velocity and sediment transfer rate. Then I determined the critical shear velocity. Here you can see U star C S. U star C means like uh, critical uh, shear velocity. Uh, S means during the seepage or the during the injection. So here you can see if we extrapolate this line like that, then we can get a minimum value from where we can define this is the critical shear velocity. So we should keep in mind that critical shear velocity is a minimum value uh, from where we can define that the particle is going just going to uh, in the movement condition. So here you can see the sediment transport rate variation small, even the hydraulic gradient is going to increase. And the shear velocity value varies in very short range. And sediment transfer rate is linearly dependent or in incrementally dependent on the shear velocity. So this is for upstream edge of the seepage zone. But we have two zones, like at, at before the seepage zone and in the seepage zone. In the seepage zone, you can see uh, the shear velocity and sediment transport rate relationship. So these are more or less same. But here, once uh, we should keep uh, notice that we should notice here the shear velocity range is uh, here higher. So you can see it does not uh, cross the extrapolation line does not cross. Although if we plot all the hydraulic gradients in one figure, then it will cross obviously. So these are not parallel line. But it is very, uh, how to say, in the field of hydraulics, we say it is very difficult to determine such kind of phenomena uh, because these are highly variable in, in terms of time or in terms of uh, space or both. So it's very difficult. But here, from here, we can say that in the CP zone, the prediction line, this is what we also call the prediction line of the sediment transport. This is kind of steep uh, if we compare to the upstream of the CP zone. It means that in the CP zone, depending on the hydraulic gradient, the sediment transport rate is going to be increased. So after getting the uh, critical shear velocity, then uh, as I mentioned in the earlier slides, there were some mathematical relationship from where we can define a dimensionless quantity. So like dimensionless critical depth shear stress of the contracting force. So uh, I uh, measured the uh, drag force and the uh, normal force, like horizontal force and normal force. I calculated, then I made a relationship between the hydraulic gradient and dimensionless critical bed shear stress, and it shows. Do you remember the very first figure from where I showed a relationship in a concept, conceptual diagram from where I showed a relationship between a hydraulic gradient and the force, uh, these are kind of bed shear stress of the force. And if you remember, then it, <coughs> it showed that the uh, as the hydraulic gradient is increased, then the dimensionless critical the shear stress was going to decrease. So uh, it resembles the same scenario as the um, conceptual diagram. But here there are two kinds of estimation because I use modified logarithmic law in the CPS zone and the logarithmic law in the upstream edge of the CPS zone. So in the CPS zone, it's the kind of minimum estimation. And as the maximum, uh, as the CP, uh, at the upstream edge of the CPS zone, it is called a maximum estimation. And uh, we also compared our uh, dimensionless critical bed shear stress or the shield parameters uh, in the shields diagram. So it also matches well. So uh, we confirm that our results uh, resembles the previous literature uh, or the previous results. And here there are some discrepancy between uh, upstream edge and the CP, upstream edge of the CP zone and CPS zone. So bed shear stress determined using approach velocity. So we have to keep mind that uh, at the CPS zone, 
uh, at the after of the CPS June, bad shear stress was determined from using a approach velocity profile and CPS force on the bad shear stress is smaller because it was not directly affected by the CPS flow. Uh, there was a lateral uh, effect or the side effect. But in the CPS zone, injection reduces. So if a surface flow is happening over a particle and another force is coming from the bottom uh, of the particle, then it is generally it reduces the effective weight of the particle. So it uh, it makes the particle in a condition from where it's kind of precarious. Like uh, if something uh, a little force is happening or little force is going to happen, then the particle will start to move. So it's kind of a reduction of the effective weight of the particle. So it accelerates the particle injection. So it creates uh, the sedimentation in a small force. And we uh, obviously did not consider the roughness of the cohesionless sand particles because roughness increases the uh, shear force or the bad shear stress. In injection contributes to lower, yeah, so it is very obvious and common. So these are the main findings of the uh, first experiments uh, from where we wanted to determine the incipient condition or the sediment dynamics by using the sediment dynamics of a uh, particle uh, of soil, soil particle from the viewpoint of laboratory analysis. From now, I would like to talk about rheological modeling of the sand surface uh, during low confining stress. So this, this analysis is uh, from the viewpoint of soil mechanics, like here we have to uh, say that in soil mechanics, uh, like if we uh, consider, if we consider a uh, surface soil erosion runoff or soil liquefaction due to internal erosion, this happens due to a small kind of pressure or confining stress. And it is uh, very much important if we want to define or make a rheological property uh, profile of the soil during the low confining stress then the main problem is we don't know some physical parameters or the strength parameters like what is the angle of internal friction or the cohesion of the soil in low confining stress so we need to take the challenge to determine this kind of parameters but the problem is how to determine this kind of parameters in a small uh, low uh, low stress because in low stress because most of the geotechnical apparatus or geotechnical lab or the geotechnical analysis uh, deals with the high pressure or like in measurement of kilopascal or megapascal so uh, our main concern is to get apparatus which can determine very small changes of the stress uh, so if we see this kind of figure you can see like uh, it is a relationship between the normal stress and the shear stress this is a kind of yield uh, line of the locus, yield locus from where we can define the fatal line. So if we consider the fatal line, then you can see the fatal line is lying between elastoplastic model and viscous resistance model. What is elastoplastic model? Before, during, uh, when the soil is acting as a solid particle, like it is not, it is not a mud flow or it is not a uh, landslide. So soil is uh, like if we, consider a soil from the viewpoint of what the soil, what we see in the field condition, which is not flowing, uh, uh, which is a static soil. This is kind of, it is kind of elastic and plastic material soil. So it's a, we can define an elastoplastic model from the properties. But when uh, in a mud flow, the soil uh, is, uh, the water is mixed with the soil and soil particle is mixed with the water by in vice versa, what we say. In that condition, soil is, uh, it moves like a uh, fluid and it's moved in a mass. So here uh, it, it becomes a fluid or viscous resistance model because in that case, we uh, find the viscosity from the viewpoint of fluid, from the viewpoint of water or something like that. So uh, we have to find a condition in the failure line, so we can say in the line, we have to find two things, like elastoplastic things, in, like in solid form, and like in viscous thing, in fluid form or liquid form. Then 
uh, for low stress, we found a novel apparatus, which was previously uh, tested or verified in the field of powder technology, pharmaceuticals, or fine chemicals for defining the flowability of the fine particles. And it is it has proven applications in, in, in this field. So it is excellent reproducibility and sensitive. It's very sensitive apparatus and it has advanced control system and it also conforms the standard of STM. And it can, uh, why it is promising in geotechnical analysis? Because it can measure the low stress. This range, this is very low stress in the, uh, in the field of geotechnical. Generally, geotechnical people does not consider such kind of stress for their analysis. And it has the finest aeration control unit from where we can resemble the seepage flow through the bottom of the uh, soil column or the soil mass. And we used a fine soil silica sand, case number seven, and it was the properties like median diameter and the particle density of like that. And what is the principle of this kind of, this apparatus name is FT4 uh, powder rheometer. So in the, okay, what is the operating principle of the FT4 shear stress device? So how we determine the shear stress by using this kind of apparatus? So it has a shear cell, like circular shear shell, and it has some blade, which can rotate over the sample. Like if the sample is here, then it can rotate like that. And we have to give a normal stress by using uh, by using this kind of axis, axial force. Then, uh, and we have to, by using the advanced control system, we have to also give the uh, at rotating uh, velocity of the shear cell. Then, uh, how we determine the Yield locus. Yield locus is a function of uh, yield locus is a function of like shear stress. So like these are the shear stress and normal stress relationship. So if we uh, give a particular normal stress, then we can get the shear stress. So uh, shear stress is a function of normal stress. So we have to give a normal stress for a consolidating consolidating load. Then we can determine the shear strength or shear stress. And by plotting such kind of points the, this is kind of a peak points or the failure points from where the soil start to fail. So by using this, we can get a real locus like that. So it has two steps. The shear cell has a two steps like consolidation and pressure. So this is this step is pressure. So it uh, if we apply a pressure or pre normal stress, then it reaches, then it becomes steady state flow where the shear stress and bulk density does not change, then the force comes to uh, force comes to uh, zero shear stress, then it starts to increase again and it reaches a, uh, at a particular normal stress, it reaches a failure point from where we can define a points, which is the failure points of the, uh, for such a normal stress. Then, we can measure such kind of shear points like that by repeating such kind of stress automatically. If we put set the program in this device, then it will automatically uh, create such kind of points uh, by analyzing such kind of uh, steps, doing such kind of steps. So it has some uh, mathematical formulation. Uh, there are some relationship between the torque. So it, it creates a torque then uh, from where we can determine the shear stress. And this is the time variation of the shear stress. And if you see, as the time goes, the shear stress goes to increase, then it reaches a peak, then it fails. After fails, the, there is a residual strength. But since we were dealing about the maximum strength, which can resist the incipient motion or the just uh, moving of the particle, so we consider the peak strength, not the residual strength. And we also confirmed, we wanted to see how this normal stress uh, apparatus the result of the normal stress or the this kind of failure line uh, by using the FT4 apparatus resembles with the uh, direct shear stress or DST apparatus. Direct shear stress apparatus is widely used in the geotechnical engineering field. And for such, for determining the soil properties like shear strength or angle of repose, we uh, 
or making a normal stress and shear stress relationship, we do use this kind of apparatus uh, widely or popular. It is very popular. And these are the uh, range for normal stress range. You see the range is higher than more and more higher than the FT4 range. And for 100, 200, 300 kilopascal, we determined the we did the test to resemble the result with the uh, FT4 test. And it has a, a, another um, system of the apparatus. It has aeration control unit by which we can make the soil mass or soil particle. Uh, it, it makes the so by using air, we make this is a fluidic condition from where we define or we can get the uh, viscous resistance model. As I mentioned earlier, in the trailer line, the soil lies between two models as elastoplastic model and in viscous resistance model. So we have to get, so we call it uh, fluidization. So if we increase the aeration or air velocity here, then it becomes fluidic. And in the fluidic, before the fluidization, soil particles are bonded each other or there are higher friction force or the shear force. But during the fluidized, fluid, uh, fluidized state, there is no friction force between the particles and <clears throat> And the torque or the force only coming from the viscosity <clears throat> but when there are friction we cannot determine torque which is only coming from the viscosity and we needed to calibrate our ft4 um, blade ft4 shear blade to determine this kind of uh, viscous viscosity uh, for the soil particle so we calibrate with the standard fluid standard liquid or standard uh, liquid. So this is the JS100 to 160,000. So as the number goes higher and viscosity becomes, it becomes very viscous. So this is very viscous fluid or the liquid. And from uh, this, we calibrated our uh, FT4 shear blade and we found a mechanical constant <clears throat> from this kind of relationship. And we wanted to check how the density affects during the low stress. So I uh, made the relationship of the filler line for different kinds of density. So uh, for shear stress changes, so from this relationship, we can say that the shear stress changes negligibly with the normal stress at shear rate of six degree per minute. So you should keep mind that in uh, FT4, we generally give the shear rate in the form of degree per minute or uh, like 6 and 12 degree per minute for different densities but uh, it's almost same during the low normal stress but although it has some deviations at the uh, uh, higher normal stress is given although the range is very small like uh, from 0 to 3.5 kilopascal in comparison to 100 to 100 or 300 kilopascal but we can say that since we wanted to check uh, how the uh, soil behaves during the low, very, very low confining stress, which is uh, very uh, sensitive to measure, like this range, 0.01 or 0.009, something like that. So it shows that here it doesn't change, although we are changing the density of the soil, its standard power density. Then, uh, we uh, choose a density range like this, then we measure the <coughs> field line at 6 degree per minute shear rate. And here we define two range, like low normal uh, stress range, like <coughs> two normal stress range. One is fixed, like 0.01 to 3, and one is variable. I changed or varied the uh, normal stress range 0 0.0125 to 5 to 10, then 15 to 22. Then, but consolidation stress, which is kind of a, how to say, it's kind of pre-stressed condition. So consolidation stress was also changed. So here we wanted to see how, uh, if we change the range of the normal stress, then how the failure line departs from each other. So here we can see that we can see that field line departed very low stresses, like these low stresses, it departs 
from one to another, irrespective of consolidation stress. So although the consolidation stress is not same, but it changes during the, this uh, low normal stress. So from where we can define the angle of repose and, and we can also define the cohesion of the soil, what we wanted to determine during the low confining stress. And we also determine the angle of internal friction and cohesion. Then we made a relationship between consolidation stress against angle of internal friction and cohesion. Then it shows that as the consolidation stress increases, the angle of internal friction goes decrease. And the cohesion is also decreased, but uh, there was a single deviation of at this range. It deviates from the uh, trend. And here you see, I highlighted here that during the low normal stress range, angle of internal friction in comparison to this normal stress range, in angle of internal friction was higher and cohesion was higher for higher normal stress range. And this is this results like this uh, black and th th there are huge points here. And so, uh, yeah, it shows very, uh, how to say, dark. So these are the normal stress for DST, like direct shear stress separators. So as I extended the normal stress, uh, the failure line from which was determined from the FT4 for uh, DST. So it shows that failure line in the high normal stress, high stress condition can be applied in the low stress condition because it matches, failure line is matched. This is the failure point, so failure condition here it the filler line for ft4 matches with the filler line of the uh, direct shear stress so it means the ft4 results are applicable in geotechnical analysis for standard geotechnical analysis and in in case of aeration test results so we showed that we uh, determine a condition from where fluidization happen or fluidized condition happens like as the air velocity and the air pressure we we, if we make a relationship, then we show that as the air velocity increases, the air pressure also increases. But at some point, the linearity relationship becomes changes. So here, the linear linearity is changes, deviates. So it means here, uh, it is not increasing as the uh, previously it was increased. So this condition is called uh, fluidized. We, we can confirm that this is fluidized. Uh, uh, condition so we can get we can find a air velocity range from where we can set the air velocity to get the fluidized condition so at like from this range in this range we can say that if we uh, put the air velocity level like that then we can find the fluidized condition of the soil particle then uh, as I showed some relationship previously then <coughs> from the calibration result, then we determine the viscosity coefficient of uh, from such kind of relationship against the air velocity. Then it shows that as the air velocity increases, you should keep mind that you should keep mind that this air velocity range is found from this kind of relationship. So we are only dealing with the viscosity. So when viscosity can be defined, when it becomes liquid or fluid. So this kind in this kind of air velocity it becomes fluidic so we can get the viscosity coefficient like how viscous the as we increase the air velocity how uh, viscous is the particle or the soil particle during the mud flow or during the landslide we can get some idea so here you can see as the air velocity uh, is getting higher then e, the air Viscosity coefficient, viscosity is going to be nearly constant. Here, the velocity is, uh, the viscosity uh, coefficient is going to be constant as the, although the uh, air velocity or injection, this is kind of injection is going to be increased. So at fluid, fluid state or sand boiling state, viscosity coefficient changes depending on the tube speed and the air velocity. And effective stress between the soil particles becomes zero. And the force only due to the viscosity can be measured in the form of torque. From the torque relationship, we can find such kind of uh, viscosity coefficient result. So this is very uh, promising because uh, from the Newtonian or non-Newtonian uh, 
fluid behavior, there is a relationship between the shear stress and the uh, shear rate. So from the uh, ratio of the shear stress and the shear rate, we can find a viscosity coefficient. So uh, viscosity coefficient at uh, one stage doesn't get changed for the stent fluid. So this, it means that uh, at some stage, it uh, resembles the Newtonian fluid behavior, Newtonian fluid behavior. And finally, I, I would like to conclude my uh, presentations by you showing some conclusions here. So what source the conclusion? In case of, uh, from the viewpoint of hydraulics, we uh, determine the incipient motion for the sand particles. So we found two kinds of maximum forces in the, and minimum force. So maximum force was found at the upstream edge of the seepage zone and minimum force was found at the seepage zone. So we determined a range from where we can uh, make a challenge or we can uh, give an uh, idea of the range of the seepage uh, or wet shear stress uh, when the seepage force is happening. And in case of rheological modeling, uh, we determine the angle of internal friction and we also determine the cohesion at the very normal stress range. And it shows that failure line of high stress condition can be applied in low stress condition. And in fluid state, it was found that fluid moves like fluid and viscosity coefficient decreases as the air velocity and the drip speed increases. So by combining such kind of things, we can build a system from where we can uh, make a system or uh, how to say, a discipline from where we can uh, discuss more elaborately the soil erosion problem in future. So in future work, actually, I would like to say here from here, like in future, our interest is to make a uh, propose a subject or topics which is specialized in surface soil, and it is known as surface soil mechanics. So we would like to extend our topics from the viewpoint of uh, conventional soil mechanics and which will have excellent academic originality and creativity and where hydraulics and soil mechanics will be related. How we can do it? Doing some elaborate laboratory experiments for different kinds of material and different kinds of flow velocities and seepage flow velocities uh, by using erosion modeling that distinguish surface and inside soils behavior. And this is all from me and thank you for your kind passion and thank you for uh, your uh, kind attention. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir, for your wonderful and motivating speech. And I'm extremely sorry due to uh, some technical issues. I could not join the first part of this program. Uh, whatever, hope that it will be helpful for all of the participants. Now I'll read out the question from the comment box. Okay. Okay, here we can see that uh, some uh, feedbacks, uh, very informative idea series. Thank you, Arif sir, for sharing your knowledge. Special thanks to BRDC for arranging this idea series. Okay, thank you. Jackie Hussain. Yeah, thank you, Jackie Hussain, yeah, for your nice comments. And next. Okay, do you have other comments, like uh, no. regarding the presentation? Uh, no, sir. I think there is no further comment in comment okay. section. Okay, okay. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir, once again for your valuable time. And yeah, yeah. oh, sir, uh, sir, we can see some feedbacks also. Uh, MD Kambur Jaman Ibrahim, I am very much motivated with this session and also found an idea for my own research. Thanks, Arif, sir. Thanks, dear DC. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I, I'd like to say that, yeah, Mohammed. Kamrud Jamon Ibrahim, yeah. This is my success if you get some idea from where you can choose or you can decide your topics. So this is my success. <laughs> and this is the success of uh, BRBD also. Oh, there is a uh, question from Jackie Hussein. What is your yeah, yeah. research? Will you please elaborate it a little more? No, actually, yeah, Il Locus is the, if I say, like, I wanted to show you a uh, relationship between the normal stress and shear stress. So, uh, shear stress is a function of normal stress. So, if we give a particular normal stress, then at certain uh, shear stress, the soil will start to failure or at a peak strength. When the normal shear strength reaches the peak strength, 
then it will start to fail. So this point is uh, is a function of normal stress. So at each normal stress, you can get a shear stress value. And if we plot this kind of uh, points for different normal stress, then <clears throat> we can find a linear relationship between normal stress and shear stress. And this is called a yield locus or the failure line. Thank you, sir. Another feedback is Toto in the best of luck. Uh, thank you, Toto in the. Okay, thank you, sir, once again for your valuable time. And also thanks the audiences for your participation. Oh, there is, we can see there is an, another feedback. How can, uh, how to, can we calculate a failure phenomena during loss stress? Uh, I think the question will be low stress. It is not low stress. So it, it may be, yeah, I, I think it is, uh, he, it is kind of type mystic. So it, yes, it, will be, yeah, it will be low stress. Low. So as I, as I showed, uh, in my presentation, uh, so you can you can uh, determine the fatal line uh, from by using the direct shear stress apparatus or other kind of apparatus which are widely used in the geotechnical field. But in case of low stress, you have to uh, consider the low stress or the low confining stress condition. So you have to uh, find or you have to make a special kind of apparatus which can deal with the low stress condition. Condition. So we used uh, apparatus uh, which is called FT4 powder ummeter. Uh, by using this, we determine the uh, failure line uh, of during the low stress condition. Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, if there is no question, then I I just would like to uh, 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 yeah. So do you have any other uh, talk or any comments about this kind of program of this program? Or, thank you, sir, once again for your valuable time. And also thank the audiences for their participation. Yeah. So there is, so, yeah. So there is, uh, there is another announcement for uh, BRDC. Our next research idea series number 15 will be held soon to get updates of our activities. Following our page, join our group and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We are happy to inform you that we are now a family of nearly 34 K members, including groups, pages, channels, and LinkedIn pages in a very short time. Stay with Gobesho Khotechai, be researcher BD, and invite your research enthusiast friends to our platform. Thank you for being with us. Wish you all success and good health. Goodbye, sir. Yeah, yeah. So I, I just would like to uh, say thank you to uh, BRBD for giving me an opportunity to present my research in, in a wide audience, I hope so. <laughs> And thank you. I think it, I think it is uh, recorded. So uh, and you will upload it in your YouTube channel, yeah. So no, and the pages yeah. also. Yeah, yeah. So thank you once again, and thank you for your uh, moderation, and mm -hmm. thank you all all the team of BRBD, and maybe see you next time in one mm -hmm. program and say some events. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much.